Ben's story is super inspiring and I'm sure you're going to enjoy today's episode. His portfolio of events includes everything from music festivals, he's done art festivals, he's done conferences, he's done immersive light trails, he's literally done it all. He started out by putting events on with a £100 budget and since then he's gone on to launch successful events and award winning events such as Blue Dot and Kendall Callum. He's booked everyone from Snoop Dogg, he's booked Bjork. In this episode we talk about finding emergency headliners the week before the festival, we discuss how to pivot into new directions, we touched on burnout and how this affected him along the way. Um, but our conversation was a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Ben has had such a successful career and it's really clear to see why. So I'm sure you'll get a lot out of this conversation and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Welcome back to Business Keeps On Dancing and this is our brand new Spotlight series. Today I'm joined by Ben Robinson uh, and Ben has probably been one of the most successful promoters in the past uh, 15 years, if, if not longer. Uh, ben is Festival Director at From the Fields and uh, they look after a portfolio of events including Kendall Calling, Blue Dot Festival, Inner City Electronic, Off the Records and most recently Christmas at View Park. So they're innovators in everything they do. I can't wait to see what they achieve next. But today what we want to do is dive into Ben's journey, Ben's story and find out his secrets to success. So Ben, thank you for coming on. How are you doing? Yeah, good. It's like a bit scared of uh, living up to your hype there. <laughs> <laughs> a big intro yeah. for uh, it. <laughs> Uh, a lot of experience though, I think I'm, um, I'm really keen to, to pick your brains on, on everything you've achieved. What I wanted to do is just start off, not even how you first got into events, because I know I knew Kendall was um, uh, the first event that you started as, it was what eventually became the From the Fields portfolio, but I wanted to find out like, why events? Because there's not, you know, I know when I was younger, there was no one running around school saying, I want to run festivals when I'm older, maybe that's the case now. But what, what drew you into events? Where did that start? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, when I was younger, it definitely wasn't seen as a career choice to run a gig or a festival. It was, it was kind of more my brother and all his mates who would be watching old Glassbury documentaries and grunge documentaries and that kind of thing. You know, there's definitely that was the world of music and festivals. It certainly wasn't career orientated. I guess for me, I grew up really into music. So I just finished watching the Get Back thing with the Beatles. And like, to me, it's got a really special place my heart because my, my dad's not with us anymore but he brought us up on a diet of Queen and the Beatles and ELO and my mum was a massive Motown fan so for me that's kind of part of my nature before I knew it was mm-hmm. you know so when I kind of came through in the 90s the day the first album I bought was uh, Oasis's debut album and for me that was kind of my era of what I'd grown up with you know from my, my dad's 60s record collection suddenly there was a there was a band of my time and Anybody who lived through that will know that the energy of that time, let alone the music, was just, you know, it was infectious. We just wanted to be a part of it. You know, I went, I went to watch Oasis at Loch Lomond. It was the first outdoor concert I went to see, and that was a 40,000 cap show uh, on a grassy hill. And I found a photo of it a few years ago and showed it to a couple of people, and they thought it was Kendall Corman. <laughs> uh, it's really strange. So, like, similar stage, similar dynamics, similar trees around the crowd. Uh, similar fashion sense because it's all come back around to 90s yeah um so for me i was just obsessed from that point and I, I remember standing looking at the stage going i love this so much being in the audience what where else can i go to you know what, to make the to experience even more of this and I, you know i looked at the stages and that got me into playing guitar got me into playing bass writing my own songs and just being obsessed with music so as i was saying earlier i went to university to study computer animation which is the closest thing I could get to doing music not being able to play music uh, because I've become mildly obsessed with club visuals and shows and uh, like music videos and things like that so for me I thought that might be a journey somewhere into the music industry Uh, but still never never considered events Uh, then I came back from university having not done any work um, drank a lot of beer and played a lot of guitar I knew how to play guitar which is good but ended up in some jobs back in the villages in Cumbria um thought it'd be great to start a record label uh but ended up starting a night instead so kind of kind of got bored 
uh, of the village where we would have covers bands and you know there's a local girl who'd been on pop idol who played on her own stage in the street every every few months and a few of us were like come on we need to we need to get some of our music in one of these bars or venues yeah uh well that's where it started really um just put a gig on put a couple of bands on dj myself yeah. um didn't really see a career in it uh just saw that it was fun uh started meeting some people that made made me understand that that there was a thing there you know there was networks of people and that there was ways of doing these things talk, talk me through that transition because i think a lot of people do and i almost feel like you can't run an event until you've seen the whole 360 of it and you've literally started the, at the bottom and understood like all of the nuts and bolts to it so talk me through that transition of, of who you have to meet and what you have to find out to, to lead up to your first festival yeah for me it was yeah one little step at a time so having played in bands and played a few gigs in pubs and things like that i understood what that required from being in the band and kind of seeing that piece uh, at the time I first had the idea to, to be a promoter, I didn't know a promoter existed, I didn't know it was a thing. Uh, and my band had broken up because the rest of the band had gone travelling around Thailand and I couldn't afford to go. So I was a little bit glum about it. And I was like, well, I'm not, not going to be involved in music. Uh, and I met a guy called Andy Halsey, who uh, came into the bank where I was working at the time. So I kind of got a job in a bank in the village, just for something to do. Um, and he worked for a company called Music Links. So I had to identify him. It's like, what's your job? Do you know where you're working? And for me, I was fascinated. I was like, you're something to do with music. Explain more. And I just remember this like 20 minute queue out of the door of the bank because I was just standing there talking to him. Just, I was like, I don't care. Forget the bank. Just tell me about music. And he said he was putting together a network of promoters via an arts council funded scheme uh, that was coming out of Generator in the Northeast, which is a music development agency. Uh, and they put together a project in Cumbria and the idea was because there wasn't a music scene or infrastructure in Cumbria was to support 10 different promoters around Cumbria to basically swap bands. So they gave us, I think it was £100 a month to put a night on. And £100. £100. How far did that go? <laughs> 2005, yeah, it's not very, to be honest with you, yeah, even at the time, there's a big report to write for it as well. Um... So yeah, and they and it was it was from that and then a small music conference they did in Kendall at the Brewery Arts Centre where I got this little leaflet, an A4 leaflet that said promoter, this is what a promoter does. And I actually remember reading it as quite a quiet, um, spaced out youth at the time, uh, thinking, Oh, that sounds like you'd have to be like, you know, quite confident, you'd have to be, you know, kind of a you know, quite uh draw the attention of the room to be the promoter. You know, it seemed actually quite a scary thing and not at all in line with who I thought I was. Uh, but I thought I'd give it a go. And I gave it a go and it did, you know, I sweated my way through it. I think anybody who's been a promoter realises very quickly that you've got to be willing to fail. That's the biggest thing that you've got to be able to do. If you're not willing to fail and get back up, then just don't do it. Yeah. You know, the most dangerous thing that can happen to a promoter is early success because you think, you know, everything's going to be a success and you take too many risks from that. But for me, that first gig where I'd told all my friends, you know, invited a lot, a lot of people down, uh, the first time you do that and you've invited a band and there's one one had driven from Manchester probably two hours to come and play. And I was standing there with the barman and one mate and the band, you know, and they're going, so you put this in the local paper, have you? And I was thinking, I didn't need to do that. Uh, <laughs> I was like, put loads of flyers up though. It's like, so people are coming, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, there'll be some people. In, in so what, what year is this? So that would be probably 2003. Okay, so it's probably the exact opposite of, of how events are promoted now. Mm. Yeah, as we were saying earlier, like the difference from when, from when I started to now is, it's just it's just a different world. I was reading the other day actually that um, this um, Generation X and there's millennials, and there's a thing called Xennials, my mate told me about. Right, okay. And Xennials are people who were born kind of in between. So grew, grew up without phones, without the internet, without smartphones in the digital age, but got involved with them at an age that they can still use them and understand them. So for me, that kind of means that, you know, when I grew up, got into promoting, social media didn't exist, you know, none of those tools are there. But for the age that I'm at now, I can use them uh, while having not always grown up with them. So... Yeah, so that's interesting. So we'll how does that 
Um, so yeah, going from running those shows and starting to open the councils, were festivals even on your radar? Was it just like let's keep up more shows on and see? No, see so I um, put a few shows on on a Friday night, and um, then I got invited to be involved in the local community music festival. Uh, and I spent my Wednesday nights after work for about six weeks going to these meetings in the pub, uh, where there was a committee had been drawn together, and. They wanted to get Mongolian throat singers into the village and they wanted to get like Arts Council funding of like £200,000 and when none of that actually materialised because it was all a bit out of reach. But they just decided not to do anything and I was like, I've just, as a, you know, for the age I am, I think was maybe around 20 at the time, I was like, I've just given up a Wednesday night, like six weeks on a row when I could have been doing something else. Surely we can do something. Uh, so me and... Uh, the local journalist, Andy Keogh, basically were part of that group. And we said, look, let's just do something ourselves. So I basically got all the artists, that I, the DJs that I booked for my nights. And uh, we got one marquee, put that by the cricket pitch, uh, called it Nine Standards Festival, and had a weekend of music for about 300 people. Okay. And then from that, and I mean, that was, I didn't, yeah, I didn't intend to do a festival. It was more being invited to be part of something that then, wasn't going to happen and me going do you know what it's just be a real waste of time if we didn't so let's just do it and then at that event andy smith who i knew from the promoters network came over and had a look at it and he said this is amazing you've basically created a 300 capacity gig in a, in a village where there's only about twice as many people as that live here yeah why don't we try and do something like this in kendall where there's a there's a town and um that was the genesis of Kendall Calling in that moment. So what year did Kendall Calling start then? 2006 was the first Kendall Calling. Okay, and what did the event landscape look like there, back then? I don't know because I didn't know there was one. Oh yeah, that was the start <laughs> of it, I guess, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, we did Kendall for a couple of years where for me, I was just doing something that I had a drive to do and I could see my friends would be interested in. You know, we'd gone to, growing up going to Leeds Festival, uh, driving two hours there and back, you know, we, we, when we were younger, we'd go to gigs in Leeds and Manchester, but where we were growing up, that that was like a big outing, and I think we were just like, let's just do something on our doorstep, you know, let's just do something closer to home, let's bring some bands that would never usually come to this area, into this area, that's what we did with Kendall Hall, and the first opening night, we booked Pendulum for it, and when we booked Pendulum, we had no idea who they were. Uh, but the release slam around that time, Zane Lowe just started playing them and hammering them. It was the biggest record in, in the world that he used to do. Uh, and by the time it actually happened, it was just this major deal that Pendulum were actually going to come to Kendall. The fact that we were coming to Cumbria at all was like mind blowing to people. You know, that's 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 what we really tried to achieve and did with Kendall. We wanted we wanted people from an area where they just don't think that that will ever happen around there. You know, kind of that kind of attitude that you kind of have when you don't grow up in a city and there's not a lot of stuff on your doorstep. We just wanted to, you know, to kind of bring bring that to people. And did you have a clear vision of what Kendall Colin was at that point? Or was it a case of you knew there was demand there, you knew you could tell him, <laughs> let's see what we can put around it? Um, we, Lawrence Festival would announce it six weeks before it happened, believe it or not. We were looking back through some emails a couple of years later and we're like, are we mental? Why did we do that? <laughs> I would never do that now. Um, no, working with Andy, it was weird when we sat down, we would, we would sit, sit, sit around and grab, go for a pint and be like, let's do a festival. And, and in my head, even though we were talking about what tents we would get, I, I just couldn't wrap my head around visually imagining what we were trying to do. Like putting a band in a venue, I could get that because I could wrap my head around it. But when we were talking about doing a, doing a festival, you know, Festivals can be for 500 people, they can be for 50,000 people, you know, they're very different in dynamics. Um, so I think it kind of, you know, had a bit of a vision that it was going to be a gig in a park. And uh, the first one was in the centre of Kendall, uh, in Abbots Hall Park. But I don't even think until the tents went up and the people arrived, I really could visualise or know what, what we were doing. And, mm. you know, I mean, I knew we were putting British Sea Power on because Andy had promoted them a couple of times, it would be great knew that Pendulum would be great, you know, I knew we'd been to gigs, but I didn't really until everybody came into that space really understand what it was. Uh, but then very quickly, you get that feel when, you, when you're in an event, you know, it's weird, it's all the little things, all the character come together and it creates this kind of 
atmosphere or this spirit or this kind of thing that everybody can plug into and like everyone shares that kind of experience and is it almost like the because going from from gigs and club shows to festivals i feel like the difference is I feel like with festivals just the lineup and tickets and a venue doesn't cut it you really have to like curate what that experience is that happens in between all of those points so is that just a natural progression that happened with you when you start to think okay i need to fill up this field with things to do for yeah I think because because we've gone to loads of festivals and I knew what I'd liked and I didn't like, I think that was what me, me and Andy set about building, really. We would, you know, we would go and talk to our friends and go, what do you love about a festival, right? What do you hate about when we go to these bigger festivals or these other shows? What is it that you don't like? Like, oh, the beer's always shit. Do you know, it's overpriced. And be like, right, okay, well, let's make sure that we don't serve Carlin and uh, the beer tastes good and it's not overpriced so on every little moment at Kendall that's what we would do we would make sure that rather than I used to have it in my head actually rather than when you go to a festival and there might be a queue to get in and then you get in there and it's an overpriced at the bar and then you try and go and watch your favourite band but you can't get anywhere near them and the sound's not very good you know that's like four shit things in a row which means that you're not really in the best mood and so for us we were like how about if we flip that around you know how about if we make sure there's no queue you're pleasantly surprised that you've not everybody no queue. You go to the bar, it's actually reasonably good price. And we, we brought in Real Ale before Real Ale was really a thing. We had Black Sheep Brewery when it was just the kind of the, the, the locals who were drinking that kind of thing, you know. So we just tried on every bit, you know, and then not having too many people at the show or too, too, too big a queues to, uh, to get into the tents and things like that. And, and I think that became what people loved about Kendall you know they could see that it was people that loved shows that were putting putting it on uh and they felt like they were being invested in and that just created this really really amazing bond what does Kendall call and look like now to you 15 15 years into it versus what it well it's an empty field at the <laughs> hopefully back yeah <laughs> a, a, website, a website and an empty deer pond. <laughs> in terms of the format and how has that um experience how has that evolved over the past uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's, as, as I was saying earlier, I mean, it's a long time. Um, so I guess where we started in that field in the first year, uh, we had uh, a main stage and a big top, we had a bar tent, second stage, regional bands. Uh, we moved from there into a farm in the second year, uh, we added a dance stage. Into the third year, we added a folk and kind of roots stage and comedy. Um, in its fourth year, we moved it to Lyle the Deer Park, which was 2011. When we got there, we took the main stage and made it an outdoor stage. I was petrified about that. I was like, it always rains. What we're doing, outdoor main stage, will it ever work? Uh, at that point, it was probably about a reason 10,000 capacity. And we did that for a couple of years. We brought in much more like traders and then other entertainment. We brought in my wife. It wasn't at the time then, but brought in Roxy to do decor and like the creative side of it then became a thing. You know, as, as the festival got bigger, we started to look at art installations. Um, that led us to realise that, you know, environments are really important. So then we opened the Woodland Stage, uh, which developed into Lost Eden, which is an immersive um, arts trail, and kind of lighting, kind of rig and install area. So kind of grew into the park bit by bit um growing through those years I think on our 15th birthday um we pulled out an absolute stonker lineup we got snoop dog to the festival that's probably one of the greatest things i've ever seen did you meet him uh no <laughs> came in on his bus late right because he'd got stopped at the airport this is i love this this is like he's like this is why this guy is just who he is uh he had four hundred thousand euros in a duffel bag going right. through an italian airport and obviously got pulled aside and had to explain why he had four hundred thousand dollars in a duffel bag. I mean, it might just be his wages from the day before. You know, it probably was. Uh, so that was all over the news, and we were sitting on site going, "Oh man, please tell me you can make it. This is not good." So yeah. we were a little bit nervy over the Saturday, but he made it ten minutes late. He arrived on his tour bus, jumped off his tour bus straight onto the stage. No did the gig, check, no, nothing. nothing at all, no, just like literally straight on with the audience, like, is he coming, is he coming, because they've been reading the papers as well. Right. So it was electric when he stepped on the stage, you know, everyone was just... <laughs> did we ever get to the bottom of the life. The duffel bag full of cash. Well, they let him through, so, you know, <laughs> I guess it, Probably I bribed guess him it with, was okay. with the duffel yeah, bag, maybe. Yeah, let him through with half of it. 
have you ever had any um yeah anything any no shows any hard things to deal with while you've been on site um yeah every single thing you can think of we've had uh I've touched what i like to think we've had um the last one which was was really interesting because i thought we'd seen everything we'd seen from doing the festival for years but it would have been um 2017 and 2018 uh we booked run dmc and between us and run dmc we got the dates wrong uh there was long talks in the office as to whether or not that was us or them uh but there was a bit of a stalemate that everyone wanted to just fix it it was one of those moments like okay it's a bit woolly as to whose fault this is because nobody really wants to be like you know this was your paperwork or our paperwork but you know um you would have thought somebody between our two teams would have had a conversation before the tuesday of the show to realize that we, we'd been advertising them on the Saturday and they thought they were playing on the Friday. So it took all that time. Yeah, they really only nice. came out as <laughs> literally as they were, <laughs> the two, you know, the TM and things was going, oh no, we're not there on that night. We're like, whoa, you, you have probably haven't looked at our website or any of our marketing materials. Like, okay, yeah. probably haven't, you know, we've got a lot of gigs. Yeah. And so we found out on the show week that our Saturday night headliner was not going to be able to do it. So we looked at putting them on the glow tent on the Friday night, um, but we just couldn't make it work. We couldn't put the main stage headliner in a tent for 4,000 people. We're like, this one, it's probably not going to be safe. Two, we'll upset as many people who can't see it as you can, because you know a lot of people have bought a ticket for it. Um, so bless him, Andy, uh, business partner who's a booker at the time, um, rang a couple of agents, uh, and he rang the agent to try and see if we could get Bastille. And the agent was like, really sorry, no, that's still not going to happen. You, you're going to need a plan B. And he said, thanks, that's brilliant. And he was like, I, I've just told you, you can't, they're not, they're not available, but they're still aren't available. He said, no, it's fine. You give me a good idea. So he rang plan B's agent <laughs> and said, is plan B available this Saturday? Can yeah. he pull us out of the, out of the sticks? And uh, he said, yeah, great. So he booked okay. plan B and managed to kind of pull that gag when we announced it to the audience. We're all sitting there like, it's Tuesday night, it's a sold out show. We've literally got to just press this button here and tell the whole audience, you know, that not only are the Saturday night headliners not playing, that we've only just worked out that they can't now. So let's try and word that so no one sounds like an idiot. Yeah. Uh, but we managed to pull the gag of it. It's okay, we've got a plan B. <laughs> and uh, it worked really well. Went down a yeah, it did because everyone went, ha ha, I like that gag. Love plan B. Actually, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that was terrifying. Like the 10 minutes before we had to press, okay, is this going to work? Are they going to get this gag? Is this going to be okay? Yeah. It was, uh, it was tough. So, how have you, because Kendall has been going for, um, I know it's technically 17 years, but it will be the 15th one. Um, when it happens, how have you maintained the success of a festival for so long? Because it sounds like you were around at that initial boom of the festival starting to become um, a lot more accessible and just the kind of sheer volume of them up until now where you've got a festival for literally any niche, any any type of event you want to put on as a festival for. So how have you kind of moved with the times as that's happened to stay ahead of your game? Yeah, I think because it's a good question. And as I say, it's a long it's a long period but I guess what we were really adamant about at the start was that we weren't greedy with it you know it was really important to us that even though we could grow the festival we didn't grow too fast mm -hmm. so I think you know over the first up to the first 20,000 crowd in there it was two, two to three thousand people each year we would grow the festival by I think it was only a couple of years where we jumped it maybe about four or five thousand capacity but in that time frame you know the, there's other festivals he, he jumped a lot further a lot quicker some of them aren't, aren't still around, you know, there's uh, big shows like Festival, you know, that everybody felt was going to be around forever and, and, and isn't anymore. Uh, we kind of kept an eye on, you know, if you get too big and we spend too much money on headliners, it only takes one year to not be able to sell the tickets and then we might not be around. So we just tried to find the right place for us, really, where we felt like we were delivering better lineups every year, delivering a quality experience on the ground. Um, and mainly making sure that we looked after the people who come up with us. So we didn't change the festival dynamic. Uh, we didn't change that bond and that relationship we've had with the people who come year on year. Uh, for us, we, you know, we, we've had years where we sold like eighty percent of the tickets before announcing the lineup. You know, because that audience trusts us. You know, that audience have come through the festival. 
so there's that where we've just always tried to be honest and always tried to book and curate the festival as if we're doing it for us or our, or our mates you know and not you know not just seeing it as a commercial venture um so i think people have noticed that people feed back to us that you know they, they do get that my mum bless it was on the on a train the other day and got talking to somebody who goes to Kendall Common every year. She said, oh, oh yeah, my son, son's involved in that. He said, oh, how's, how's he involved? She's like, oh, he's one of the guys that runs it. It's like, oh, oh so I get their emails. It's signed of Andy and Ben. And she was like, yeah, yeah it's Andy and Ben. <laughs> and I just, to me, that reminded me of like, I feel like my name does actually go on every, you know, per- personally on every, on every piece that goes out because it is still me and Andy doing it, you know, along with uh, the team we now have around us. So I think that's a big part of how how we've sustained this, the same people and grown with those people. But also one of the things I love to see, and one thing that has happened with Kendall is it's become a generational thing. So, you know, kids want to go there. They, they look up to it now because it's been around so long. It's like a rites of passage thing of like, can't wait till I can go to Kendall without my parents, yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. And I remember watching uh, Primal Scream in 2013 uh, and seeing a guy with his, bumping into one of my mates. And he, and he was there with his four-year-old kid on his shoulders. I was like, wow, and we started it, you know. One he, of those he was there on you know, 12 lagers and rolling in, <laughs> rolling in the mud. And I was like, but he's coming back now with his family. And then I'm thinking, and, you know, and then there's kids though, maybe when we started it, have been really young and now coming back with their mates. Mm. And, you know, chat to people, it's quite funny. Actually. There's this point where parents will, will, will have with the kids where they just won't camp with them anymore. Yeah. It's like it's like oh it's that year, you know, he's camping with his mates now. Yeah. He, doesn't, he doesn't want to see us. If we yeah. bump into him, he will not be happy. That's a hard thing to, to bottle on kind of what is the secret to, to keeping those generations coming. You've also got the side of how it's promoted. I know you mentioned um early days it's more around like word of mouth and just kind of on the ground promo. I imagine there was a point when you started the festival when social media became a thing that we were all starting to understand for our own lives, but it was actually suddenly you can reach thousands if not millions of people who might want to attend your event so was that part of the progression of, of the festival at the same time yeah yeah as, as i was saying earlier when we were chatting about this um i looked at some graphs i don't know why i was doing it um but graphs are good uh and it's just a graph of the growth of social media in terms of facebook's overall uh growth and then i looked at the growth of kendall Corman in terms of capacity and when, and when that really happens and it tracks exactly so in terms of the the launch of all the boutique festivals we talked about as well before you had an event page on facebook there was no way at all to create a sub group of people and get and get information to them be that what's on where it's on very simple information get them excited uh promoting before facebook event pages and i say facebook event pages because in terms of social media that that was there wasn't anything like that before in any way, on any platform. Um, we would uh, our entire marketing campaign would be flyers and posters, quite simply. And as you said, you used to fly yourself. Yeah, it, it was the, the thing, you know. <laughs> being, and being a good promoter was quite simply whether or not on a weeknight you would be willing to drive around the cold of the uh, cold of Cumbria for me personally. You know, going village to village, putting flyers in like parish parish newsletter boxes you know in places that probably nobody ever, would ever see but if you didn't do it you would you would not be able to, to sit sit still because you'd be thinking oh, if, I, if it gets to the show and i lose a load of money i'm really going to regret sitting here and watching hollyoaks omnibus <laughs> and not getting out do you know what i mean and putting out that extra flyer somewhere yeah yeah i guess that's where it took a motivated mindset really took at that period uh, marketing really took you to be outgoing to get out there and talk to people or do things to go into a shop and actually you know go and talk to the person who owns the shop who usually look at you like well you can leave them here nobody ever takes them at least i was with this clothes shop and kendra's like nobody ever touches them you know no one ever takes one i was like but is it okay if i just put them there anyways yeah, <laughs> drawing in favors and anything you can to make make sure people know about them and then through to now um I guess it'd be interesting to to understand that you you built Kendall to the point where where you know it was a huge festival. You had people coming back each year. You had generations coming back. At what point did your attention switch to 
new festivals? At what point did From the Fields come into play as a company? Yeah, it's, I think it was probably about five or six years into Kendall Calling. I mean, for me, because I'd done Nine Standards Music Festival, which is a community music festival, I did that alongside Kendall over the first few years. So I was always doing a couple of things, and prior to that, the, the night I promoted, which is called Fugitive Sounds, I kind of continued all that aspirations too. So there's always a few things in the mix, but when Kendall bubbled up, me and Andy just went, let's get rid of everything. And, you know, we, we, hit, we hit something here, let's not take it for granted, let's put everything into it. So we did that for quite some time. Uh, and we got offered other opportunities off the back of it, you know, because of the networks of people we were then talking to. Um, and I think, you know, we flirted with a few smaller ideas for little shows and bits and bobs, but the real dynamic change came when uh, British Sea Pirate, a band we'd worked with, uh, hosting their album launches. We'd done one at Tan Hill, which was in the news last week for that, so British this lock-in that they had when they got snowed in. Ah, uh, I did see that, yeah. Yeah, so that's, so that's like 10 miles from the village I grew up in, so it used to be our local. And uh, we ended up putting British Sea Pirate on in there, and did like a, a little mini festival, which was really cool. It was launched their album, uh, Do You Like Rock Music? And uh, Simeon Mobile Disco, James from Simeon, had his stag do at it, right? <laughs> He'd just been in the studio with Last Shadow Puppets, okay. and he'd just done the Claxton album, right? So pretty British Sea Power playing in this pub where there's only 150 people, fans in it, all drinking whiskey with the band and that. Uh, and we had to get some yurts for these special guests. When well, we found out these two yurts are basically for James to host his stag do uh, and he brought Alex Turner and he brought Claxton's and uh, it sounds like one of them bizarre situations where you're like who would you have round the table and like your last <laughs> last meal on earth or something yeah <laughs> it was it was quite bizarre no no pressure then putting no on the for them. it was just a weird little we had to we all got really worried because Alex Turner was coming that somehow the the entire of the north of England was going to turn up and try and get in yeah. So we had uh, this sign on the road saying no, no room at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Quite literally. <laughs> yeah. God, we panicked about it. Um, so yeah, so we've done some fun, fun things like that, basically, you know, from the people we got to know. And then British Sea Power said, we'd love to do another quirky album launch. Can you go and check out this site, Jodrell Bank? And so Andy went down to have a look at Jodrell Bank. They kind of like shrugged it in and went, we're not a gig venue, don't really know what we do about that. Uh, not really our thing, but, you know, th thanks for coming down for the day. And then about a month after that, they rang back. They said, oh, we've actually been looking at what you've done with Kendall Corwin. Uh, we just opened a new visitor centre. And, you know, our task down here really is to get new people involved in science, new, new audiences coming and seeing what we do. Do you think maybe there's something we could do where we put a concert on to get people to come and see the music? And while they're seeing the music, they come in and get involved in the science and kind of redefine the audience a little bit uh, that would naturally go to Jodrell Bank. So when he asked that question, that was is science anything you've been into? Is it something that was on your radar? Or are you just thinking, I can make this work? I feel like there's, you know, did you have a hunch that it was something that would work? Did it feel like a risk? So it felt like a, a big opportunity, really, because the site's just in incredible. You know, the telescope down there, you know, just you don't have to be into anything to do with science or astronomy to go and look at it and just go, wow, what what an incredible piece of architecture, what an incredibly bold thing, you know. Uh, so for us, we were just excited by the invitation. Uh, it looked like a really interesting thing. And also it just, it just let us approach different artists as well. So the two main artists that we wanted to get at the time were Flaming Lips and Daft Punk. Well, like, there's two artists that would fit this cosmic spacey kind of, you know, um, Jodrell Bank vision as a deep space observatory. And Andy went off down to, to London to meet a few agents and came back and said, yeah, Flaming Lips actually are looking at it. They want to do it. So that was the first concert we did there um, under the brand Live from Jodrell Bank. We did that in 2011. Um, so was that a bit of a tester to see if it would work or...? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was just to get to work with the Flaming Lips. I didn't really care. I nearly, I nearly <laughs> handed my cap in the next day. I was like, I'm done. That's it. I've just Life done Flaming done. Lips at a deep space observatory. I don't know how I can top this. <laughs> I'm going back into banking. It's fine. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> so after the those kind of one-off gigs, was the seed of Blue Dot there at that point? Yeah, I mean, that's 
this this is an interesting thing where you wanted to talk about where things come from. They never really come from one place because it could be said that you know British Sea Power came up with the idea for doing concerts at uh, Jodwell Bank, but you know we got a call from Teresa, head of the visitor centre there, because she had the idea that yeah it would be great if we did concerts at Jodwell Bank, and then me and Andy were obviously there within the mix going to that site visit and then going yeah actually this you know this will be a great place to to do concerts so what we did with live from Shuttle bank was a series of concerts so we did fly me lips that's a phenomenal show uh we did cigar Ross down there we did new order uh we did the australian pink floyd and um we did the halle orchestra doing a special space themed concert that was over the period of two years from 2011 to 2013 uh, and what we discovered from that was certain things sold well and certain things didn't down there. So Sigur Ross just done 7,000 tickets over two nights at the Apollo in March. And we put them on later that summer. So you wouldn't really think a band, given that they'd just done Manchester and 7,000 people had been to see them. Mm. Uh, you wouldn't really think that that would perhaps be the most successful set on sale day. Uh, but we put them on sale and, you know, they're probably worth maybe 7,000 tickets in Manchester, and they actually sold 12,000 tickets in a week. Uh, because people looked at it and they thought, okay, so the audience that is into Sigur Ross has looked at this and gone, that is an incredible sight. You know, and we thought, okay, so there needs to be more about what we're putting on there, where it's it's more of a concept venue than a concert venue. It's not just going to work for every act. Mm. Uh, you know, we had Paul, Paul Weller on sale through that period as well. It didn't really sell as well as we thought. And we were thinking, okay, so... I think a Paul Weller audience aren't quite the same audience to be inspired by what this is. Um, so we kind of left it for a little while because uh, it didn't really work financially. We broke even across what we did, but it, it was kind of hard for... And because there were big outdoor shows, if you're going to put on a big outdoor concert, you usually want to put more than one date on. So we were getting good bookings down there, say Elbow. It was a really great show that we did down there. Uh, but we'd have to find somebody to do the second day. So the whole show was reliant really on major artist touring routes. Uh, and it, it was just a little bit fickle for us. And also in terms of that, we were then up against some of the bigger promoters in terms of where those artists might be. And we thought this isn't really our game to, to be scrapping over arena artists. That's, you know, that's, that's somebody else's business in a way. Um, so we took a little bit of time away from it. And I took a little bit of time uh, watching Carl Sagan's Cosmos with my wife Roxy, and we, we were just fascinated by it. Uh, we just kind of had a look around the culture, I guess, around it. Uh, at that time, they'd had uh, a screening of Alien at the site uh, on an outdoor screen, and me and Roxy had watched that. It just kind of sat and looked at the whole place, and I just thought, Do you know what, maybe we're getting it wrong. The the awe-inspiring thing here is is the innovation of the site. It's the, the vastness of space. You know, that that's the thing to capture. That's what we need to capture. That's what this a show at this place needs to be about and then once we kind of hit upon that we thought okay let, let's go back there uh teresa had done a lot of work on the site getting green with the university that we could do a camping show there because it wasn't a very natural thing for a, for a science-based observatory to do essentially a festival um but work had gone in there john drake who's a production manager there as well he put a lot of work in so so across the team Everybody had been kind of working on how, how do we bring this thing back because we're sure there's something great here. We're just, we're just, it's just not working on the current model. And that's where we kind of collaborated and hit up on Blue Dot. So rather than having a music field with a band on at a main stage and then the science fields and the visitor centre as a separate thing, we mixed it all up. And we went, actually, it's not just music and science. Let's bring in arts. Let's bring in, you know, comedy. Let's bring in sci-fi related stuff which also all fits within that same same piece um so we started to mix that all together and, and started to do things where it wasn't just segmented and we went actually the you know what the, the culture or the type of person who knows every bit of the details who along the line the notes of an album is kind of in a similar space to maybe somebody who's researching something really interesting in science we've got people who like to experience the depth of things We've got people who like to be kind of engaged in the wonder of things as well. So we kind of tried to I guess, fuse all that together in a cohesive thing. And it, and it was quite difficult. We got some, we got the logo back. 
<coughs> variations of it. I thought it was amazing. Other partners involved thought thought it looked rubbish. Um, other people were like, it just doesn't look like a festival. It's never going to work. We need to put some big tops on there. I'll put some flowers on there. And I was like, no, it's you know, it's got to be something distinctly different. Uh, there's a lot of festivals that just look like festivals. That's you know, we're doing something from a different place. I guess it's hard to talk about these kind of things for me because it's hard to credit the amount of different ideas different people, different teams, different networks that all kind of come together. And, you know, that's why I enjoy my job as a festival director. And you get to kind of um, be in control of the, the direction. It's, it's kind of part of what the job says, but, you know, it's at times it's not doing any of it, but it's making sure that you're nudging everybody together in the right directions. Yeah. And I think that's probably one of the strengths of From the Fields, is we don't really have people who are obsessed with having to make the big decisions themselves or having to have the ideas themselves. And they're, they're some of the more difficult people I think I've worked with in teams where someone feels like it has to be their idea for it to be, you know, the next thing or somebody who's in a position of, of power who's just likes to hear their own voice more than anyone else's. Okay. Being in many of those rooms. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of them, isn't there? <laughs> so at what point um i think it's really interesting at blue dot because it's not it was something that had never been done before and that, you know you've even experienced it yourself the pushback you've had from internal teams saying no it needs to look like what would usually be the status quo and you've had to challenge that was it really clear who, who you thought the audience was going to be or did that take a bit of time you know to understand uh i think actually i'd i'd identified for me um by going to a lot of other festivals, that there was there was something not being catered for. So I played in bands. That's as I was saying. That's one of the reasons I got involved in festivals. And maybe four or five years into Kendall, where I just felt a little bit burned by. I had a passion and a love for music and festivals, but the the sheer scale of it and the responsibility, and the logistics. You know, dealing with situations around safety at festivals where suddenly I've gone from booking bands because I'm into music to being responsible sitting around with the police working out drug policies and you know what does the welfare tent look like and I'm thinking I'm, I'm not do you know what I mean this is way out of the scope of what I thought I was getting into so I actually ended up joining a band's play bass uh doing a couple of summers maybe two or three summers where I'd maybe do 15 to 20 shows in summer and that kind of reinvigorated me a little bit to just you know not have much responsibility be on a stage rather than behind the scenes. I was still running Kendall at the same time, uh, but it just got me back out into festivals in a different way. Uh, and it got to me to a lot more festivals than I would have gone as a punter, just because, you know, the offers were there and we, we were going as a gang. And from that, you know, we, we played Glastonbury, done Quaid Stage, did um, Secret Garden Party, Shambhala, Boomtown, in its first, second and third years as it, as it came into existence. So I'd kind of been in and out of a lot of a lot of festivals. And one thing I really realised was a lot of them were similar. So what I thought was really unique to Kendall Calling in terms of some tents or stages, I'd then go and see every other weekend at different shows. And I kind of came away from that and I'd thinking that I wanted to do something that was distinctly different from everything else that was out there. Uh, what I'd also done, we played a couple of European festivals and there was some of the, the light-based installations and arts that I'd seen on the, on the fringes of the festivals, looked like futuristic, a little bit Tron and techy. Mm. I thought, I think I want to do a festival that hasn't got the, the usual festival vibe, but it's got something that's a bit more futuristic, a bit more, um, as I say, based around this idea of celebrating innovation and, and how that meets music and science and arts together and, and how that, that whole piece comes. So I've had all that kind of in my head. I kind of had this vision in my head from what I'd seen at festivals and what I felt we needed to be different from. And then the site itself has got so much character and personality. Tim and Teresa, who, who run the site and the observatory, they had a lot of passion and they had a lot of vision as well from what, what how science should be defined. Because they're like, science is just not seen in the right light. Uh, it's so much more interesting, so much more open, so much more creative. There's so much creativity in science and everybody's thinking it's kind of dull brooms and lab coats. So they kind of brought a lot of character. So I had kind of these things that I'd seen I wanted to get from the physical space, where they were at with what Joddle Bank was. Uh, and we kind of fused that together. And in terms of the audience, 
the thing that I then had was I just looked back over live from Jodrell Bank. I was like, we've done six shows down there. Um, I think four of them sold 5,000 cap, a couple of them sold 12,000 cap. I was like, there's an audience of around, you know, average 7,000 people there who are already getting it. It's not like you've created something where there's going to be a, a festival at Jodrell Bank and, and it's a total risk that anybody will be into it. I was like, we've got it on paper, you know, we have this audience who come. Whether or not it's the same people coming each time, I just fundamentally felt that if somebody's been to one of our shows there and we reintroduce them to it, they will come to something which grabs, you know, as I say, grabs the concept rather than just trying to grab them through the band. So without realising that you've had the chance to test the water with these events. Yeah, it was a huge piece of R&D in hindsight. And that was, yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, that, that and also touring the world in a band um, is a great bit of market research. Yes, it's a what, great bit of market research. What yeah. of the festivals? I felt so. less guilty then when I came back to the team. It's like, do you know what, I've just been, been working really hard. off on the weekend and you guys <laughs> have been in the office. Like, it's actually been useful. Yeah. Okay, so now that to Blue Dots up and running, that, that was a, a huge success from... From the start, is this when the team starts to form with from the fields? Is this where um, other other festivals come into play as well? Yeah, I mean, it's even to today and this week, having a team and having the right amount of team doing the right amount of work with the right amount of skills, uh, given the flux of what we've been doing and the fluctuations of the festivals and the seasonal nature of it, uh, is what probably one of the biggest tasks, really is a huge task. So when we started Kendall Calling, we all were a bit younger. We just used to work 10 or 14 hour days for half the year uh, at weekends. And there was three or four of us who just worked on it all the time. So there was um, myself, Andy, Andy's brother, Jamie, and then Julie Cotton, uh, who were just embedded in it. You know, it was everything, every day. And you can kind of do that when you establish the stuff when you're younger. But as we got a bit older, as we got more shows, you know, we had to kind of arrange it a little bit better. We had to, you know, try try and actually do office hours and kind of introduce those kind of things. Um, when we did live from Jodrell Bank, we brought in um, Mark Abbott actually for a year. He's uh, you know, with SGM, SJM. So Mark, Mark was a uh, great coming into both for the marketing. Um, I think we kind of scaled up and down a little bit through those years. Um, I guess with festivals, the difficult thing is that balance between full-time staff and seasonal staff. Mm. So we, you know, at some points of the early years, again, there'll be four of us as a management team. But when it actually got to the festival, we could be responsible for a thousand people. And it's all that matrix of communications that need to be sorted, all those conversations and decisions that need to be made. And then, I think we realise as it grew, it's not so much about making the decisions, it's about having the right people to communicate those decisions all the way down to what happens on the ground. And if you get to the festival and those communications haven't been very good, then you'll just be in the share of the festival with people not knowing what they're doing and um, things not being very well arranged. So it's funny, I mean, year on year, everything just kept getting planned a month sooner. Well, let's start that sooner next year. Let's start that sooner next year, yeah. you know, where we are today. Um, you know, we're planning 10 months out in terms of what stage and stage and the site plan will look like. Whereas when we started Kendall Corner, we'd be doing that 10 weeks out. And how did you, I guess, as a leadership team, it started off as, you know, it's like a friends and family business, you're all kind of doing it for the passion of it. Was there a point when you worked out, you know, one person to look after bookings, another person's going to look after production. Like, how did that? Did yeah, that there was. On? There was. I actually remember Andy wandering around one day. It's like, we just need to get it to a point where someone, everyone can have a, like, a plaque on the desk that says, like, that's my bit. Yeah. Because everyone had a bit of a hand in everything they did. But I think that's natural. When you start something and you put in those kind of hours, in, most people are doing it because they love what they do. So you pick up the things you enjoy. Be like, oh, I'll sort out the merchandise because I really like the merchandise. Or oh, I'll talk to that person because I met them last week. So that's that's somebody I can talk to about that thing. And yeah, I think when we were became like a ten thousand plus cap festival, probably considered a medium festival, not a small festival. That's when it became very different. I remember waking up one day and going, oh, I'm in a medium sized festival now. You know, a small festival, that's kind of a nice lifestyle thing, you know, <laughs> busy in the summer, quiet in the winter, can do other things. I was like, a medium sized festival, I was like, that sounds like, a, you know, we need to get a little bit more kind of organised and serious about what we're doing. 
And where did you go from? So we've got, I think the hardest thing about a festival is that you've got a weekend, maybe a day, and that's like your one shot for the whole year to like make all your money, do a really good experience, and you're working all year round for that for that one moment. And of course, you know, running things in a field in the middle of nowhere is a challenge in itself. You then um, start the project. So you've got things like inner city electronic, you've got things like off the record, which are music and conference based. They're you know, taking place in many ven- venues across the city at one time. It'd be good to talk through where, where they came from, but also the challenges mm. that you then had to figure out. You know, you've got the festivals locked down, you have to do them now. But how does it work with all these different venues in, in one space of time? Yeah, I think actually, one of the biggest things that I realised, one of the best things to realise um, is beyond when you're doing everything yourself, it's all about having the right people. Kite simply comes, you can, you can have the best Gantt charts, management plans, to-do lists, you know, you can arrange those things all over the place. But I just realised when we on a couple of shows that I'd done that certain people on a site who were doing quite an important role, this guy called Dave Weeks, who's now a head of technical production, joined on Kendall Call, and he came to do one of the smaller stages as technical, uh, just tech on the stage. We didn't hear from him all weekend. We forgot he was there. He came to say goodbye at the end of it. And we're like, God, we forgot you were there. Are you okay? Really sorry we haven't been to see you. Do you know what I mean? Like, we should have come and talked to you. We should have come and seen if you're okay. I know, it's fine. And then we realised that there's other people doing stuff that maybe wasn't that complicated who would be knocking on the door every 45 minutes, like, you know, Oh, have you got one of these? Could I borrow this? And you thought, you know, be like, okay, so we just need to get the right people in the right places. And then you take so much work because there's so much detail to do on events. There's so many little things, as you say, that have to be right at that one time of year that you need the right people in. And we had uh, the philosophy after a while, actually, that anybody who came to us and asked for cable ties or gaffer tape, we wouldn't work with again. <laughs> that was a stress yeah, test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if they haven't been organised enough to do that or they don't go to the shop and they decide to knock on, like, you know, the call management team's door, yeah, they don't get it. They don't get it. So when you've... Um... Did you have to bring, so where, where did um, Inner City start, where did Off The Record start? Was that different partners outside of, from the fields or was that um, an idea for So di- different so? things really. So with Inner City Electronic, we'd had uh, a guy called Ben Thompson come and intern with us. Uh, I knew he would do something because he's the kind of character who couldn't sit still, full of ideas. Um, so he, he interned with us and, uh, you know, showed a lot of potential, but just had too many ideas. And then I met up with him a, a little bit later and he'd actually been running church. He'd been running the marketing uh, over in Leeds for that. And he'd done a lot of shows over a winter and uh, it kind of got him to realise that it's not about having ideas. Actually, you, you want the right shows, not too many. Uh, and he came to me with one idea and I was like, wow, this isn't like you. You've just got one idea today, Ben. It's like, yeah, I've thought this through. You know, I'd rather just do one thing well. Uh, and he was just looking at the electronic music scene in Leeds, and uh, he was probably in his early 20s at the time, uh, going out with his mates, you know, and he'd, he'd gone, there isn't something like this. I think there could be. You know, Leeds has got a really great electronic music history and scene, got some great venues, but there isn't one multi-venue piece. And also he'd been looking at things like uh, ADE and Sonar and going, you know, there isn't actually an electronic music conference-based multi-venue in Leeds, and actually maybe... You know, we can we can put one together for Leeds, which becomes a destination piece for people from all around the country as well. Uh, so it came from Ben really. I said to Ben, "Look, I'm you know I'm aware of who I am these days, mate. I have no time whatsoever. But if you've got the time and you've got the energy, you know, well, I think we can support this one from the fields. You know, we've got the networks and the knowledge. You know, we, we can back you up on this." So it's really supporting Ben and where he'd come through through the business. He then uh, brought in Ralph Lawson, had a word with him because he'd been working with him to see if we'd do the bookings. And Ralph said, I'm really into this. I think this is great. I don't just want to do the bookings. Can I be a part, part, of, the, part of the business as well? Uh, and then it was the three of us really just, just sat around and I, I just kind of relied on their knowledge of the city. You know, Ralph's been in electronic music for 30 years there. Uh, the original resident of Back to Basics, you know, he'd seen the city evolve. I'd lived in Leeds for 10 years after we started Kendall and I moved out to Leeds um, just to kind of get into some bigger networks and things like that. So I'd, I'd seen Leeds develop and it's an exciting city. 
uh, but had just moved over to Manchester to be a bit close to the to the main office that we've got. So it's interesting. Yeah, they did, did a really great job. It was uh, in mixed mag, the Guardian. You know, pe people got it for what it was. And what does that route to market look like when you've got a new event idea? Because it's not like. You know, it's not like a product that can go on a shelf and you know there's going to be football and that shop. I find the hardest thing, again, going back to the challenge of events only being able to take place at one set time, it, like the, the challenge is, is, is creating awareness, but making people understand like that, you know, that, that fits culturally with me or that event feels like my badge of honour based on, you know, who I am. So what's yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, it's not the um, staziest phrase, but it's market research. People probably don't like to admit it because promoters like to just think that they've got some kind of hunch about something. But truth is, good promoters usually have done the market research by being that person, that audience for that culture. So, you know, when, when we launched Kendall Corman, I'd been to Leeds Festival, I'd been to Soul Fest, smaller folk festivals. I'd researched it without knowing by going to all these things and working out what I liked. You know, with, um, with Blue Dot, you know, I'd kind of done the market research, as you said earlier unbeknowingly by going to play all these gigs with Slambury. Uh In terms of inner city electronic, I felt that I had that. I didn't have that knowledge particularly. I could see that there was good electronic music scene in Leeds, didn't know it instinctively. But with Ben being 20 years old and being out at house parties and gigs and talking to people and Ralph having been in the city for 30 years, I was pretty confident that between those two, you know, they'd done the market research, they knew every venue, they knew who the good promoters were to get involved, they knew who the right artists were to get involved. And that for me felt, if they curate it, pull all those people together, then by pulling those venues together, pulling resident other nights into it, you know, that creates uh, the whole mix that you would need to then have, a, have an audience. And is that something you try and keep your finger on the pulse with? Because, you know, we're all running events but we're all only getting older and the people who are now coming through uh, going to festivals are completely different like you've got things like TikTok just the way they view the world is a lot different to um, how a lot of us started out when we first started promoting events so is that something you're mindful of with the partners you bring in of the team to make sure all the time the, yeah. all the, the time who, you know walk the shoes of the ravers and the people who would come yeah I think because a lot of people a lot of people ask me what's changed like you said it earlier what's changed for you for the festivals and I think when I look at Kendall Calling what's changed more than the festival is me you know when we started it I was in my mid-20s and we were trying to make it appeal to 18 year olds I've just turned 40 Kendall Calling bill shouldn't make a lot of sense to me if it does it's in a bad place you know <laughs> a bit of it should yeah. enough because because of what Kendall Calling now is Kendall Calling is purposefully multi-generational you know Sheik playing at the last one my mum absolutely loved it loads of people loved it Tom Jones I was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen because those kids know him off uh is it the voice he's on is it that one yeah so one of those so he's known like cross-generationally and but like all the old timers that were there were absolutely loving him from seeing him originally um but you know outside those big moments I don't feel like I should instinctively know what the dance programming should be at Kendall Calling because it's appealing to teenagers from Cumbria mm. I don't I shouldn't know what that is so how, how do you find that out? It's... That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we work really hard to bring new people through the team or bring new partners and partnerships. And you, you, you just bring in those people to give you a diverse amount of viewpoints. And that's one of the best things about having a diverse team, uh, whether that's through age, whether that's through ethnicity or whether that's through gender. The best thing about that I've realised is you, you just have more opinions, you have more views, you create a more rounded experience, you create a more rounded event or a more, or more rounded product. So at the minute we got a guy called Sam Feely who's just come into our team, he's doing marketing and some of the management on Kendall Corwin and he's in his early 20s, so like 23. So I listen to Sam, I yeah. just close my own opinion off, you know, the streets are playing the next Kendall Corwin, I'm happy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That works for me. <laughs> um, I'll listen to Sam's opinion more than my own on a lot of the rest of the bill. Yeah. And uh, I think that that I, I realised early on because I'd watched some festivals. I watched their bills just get as old as the people booking it. And I thought, you're just making yourself out of date mm. because you're just recycling. Um, so that's, all, that's something that I've always been mindful of. And it just comes into that, as I said, that diversity of viewpoints will give you a more rounded lineup, will give you a more rounded bill. 
I'll make sure the experience is right. My wife Roxy um, currently she lectures once a week on a course at BIM and I'm more interested to hear what her students have told her to influence my business than Janae. Yeah. Than anybody at all. Uh, she done she done a piece with them talking about new technologies. Um, she was telling me the other day that they, they had six new technologies they wanted to talk through from an event perspective and they'd all spent about two minutes on RFID. Like, it just doesn't work. Why would we want to do it? Not bothered, it's stupid. I've got my phone, I've got my bank card, I don't want that. So it's interesting, you know, because I've done spent a lot of time talking about RFID to a lot of industry professionals of a, of a certain age, but it doesn't really matter what they think. Yeah. So you've been through festivals, you've toured as a band, uh, you've done conferences, inner city festivals and venues. Latest project has been a light trail, Christmas at Peat Park. Yeah. Like, that I was a lot to keep different. on dancing. <laughs> you did, <Yeah>. literally. <laughs> Which was a, 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 something we actually spoke on the last series uh, about was pivoting. And there was a time when people were kind of like, shit, <laughs> where do we go? What do we do? What can we... Um, what can we move into? And then and, and Light Trails uh, was kind of COVID proof at the time because it was outdoors. It was a lot more manageable than, let's say, 20,000 people crammed into a field. So where did that idea first begin? That's a good question. Again, um, so the Light Trails has been led from the work that my wife Roxy's brought into the business. So Roxy did uh, create and decor on our shows. Uh, was a, at the time doing a PhD on festivals and doing a bit of lecturing doing a bit of event work and a bit of lecturing, but she got uh, a job as the creative lead for Bournemouth Arts by the Sea Festival. And she did that by herself for one year. And that's basically programming a, a two week long arts festival across Bournemouth, which happens at the end of the season so that it will extend their holiday period. Uh, she did it for one year and then we, we talked about her bringing that into From the Fields and then kind of expanding the scope of From the Fields uh, to not to, to really be um, considered within high quality outdoor arts as well as music and you know general festival stuff. Uh, so Roxy then curated a lot of installation based artworks as part of the Bournemouth Arts by the Sea programme and also on festivals and so where we've grown these these cool areas of the festival uh, at Kendall Collins a wooden area called Lost Eden that I mentioned earlier and we started experimenting with installation art works in those places and at Blue Dot, we created uh, a zone through the Arboretum called the Outer Space. We commissioned some light based art artists into that. And Roxy actually noticed quite a few of these artists were presenting their work at Light Trails, and she just started to notice there was a lot, a lot of them popping up. Uh, so she started doing a little bit of research. Went to went to two or three across the country before COVID, uh, and it was one of the ideas in the business. And, and as COVID happened, as we tried to pivot. As, uh, as, as we all got bad backs from it. <laughs> <laughs> Spinning around with a million and one ideas. Um, Light Trails just became a really core central one for us. We could see that we had the skills in the business in terms of Roxy's curation skills to do it. We looked at the market, we could see that it was growing. Uh, there was a boom because it was one of the only things that happened in, in COVID. We noticed that uh, certain events had gone ahead in tier three. So we were like, okay, this is this is probably the safest thing we can try and do if COVID's going to be around. And we were, we were just very worn out from planning stuff that then had to be rearranged or planning stuff not knowing what rules are going to be around what we could do. So it, came, it became kind of a central focus for us from, from all of those kind of elements I've just mentioned. Uh, we assessed about 50 to 100 sites online. I did about 20 site visits myself up and down the country, trying to find the right location, trying to find somewhere where the market research was really important because we didn't want to put a light trail where there already was a light trail. Um, so we were try trying to work out where the exactly right site conditions would be. Uh, and then Roxy remembered a really nice park in Cardiff uh, that she used to have a flat next to when she'd been to university there. So as funny as it was that we researched the whole country, it kind of came out of, <laughs> of like a little moment like that. Uh, so she messaged the council and they said, oh yeah, we've been thinking about something like this. Uh, so we just presented the concept too and we said, look, there's a lot of these things around, but we're, you know, we're, we're, we're from a very different background in terms of festival and arts production. We, we want to do some of the quality, we want to do some of the artistic merit. 
don't just want to put a load of Rudolphs around and you know have chub, chubby drunk Santa in the corner. You know, <laughs> want to want to do something cool. Uh, and they bought into it. Um, it took a long time to get the site agreed. I think we only signed off on having the site in May. Did a couple of quick site visits. Um, put it on sale in August, which felt very strange because uh, Christmas is not usually considered in August. Worked with the wonderful Mustard Media. <laughs> nice together. <laughs> yeah, fantastic team. Uh, and yeah, it um, just got it right. I think it was a really interesting thing to pull together because we used a minute video with stock footage. We weren't sure what it was going to look like, but wanted to present it looking amazing. We didn't want to present it looking too amazing in case we couldn't live up to the video that we were creating. So from a creative perspective, it was really odd. Even down to being on site, we kept going, have have we lived up to what we marketed for what people will expect when they arrive? Um, getting that balance right was really interesting. But we put it on sale. We did 48,000 tickets in 48 hours, I think. Maybe 50,000 tickets in 48 hours. But it's a phenomenal response. Um, and really interesting because it was a combination of finding the right site so that there wasn't already competitor finding the right moment to launch it where light trails are a, a, a growing popularity i think the year before not not enough people would have known what a light trail was mm. for them to buy a ticket because they just wouldn't have got it uh and then it was that positioning in terms of knowing the right audience to go after working with, with you guys at mustards to go okay we want to target mums this is about targeting a mum this isn't just about targeting anybody we want to make this appealing for families this is the audience we've seen at other shows yeah, we've, we've done we've done the market research. Uh, so I was really proud of the team, really, because we we put in the work, and we've got the results of it. You know, we got the tickets because we worked out what the product and the pricing should be. We did the market research and didn't just sit around over a couple of beers and the loudest voice in the room decided. You know, we didn't we didn't do that, and it, it's easy to do that. It's easy to get carried away with your own gut feelings. Um, and yeah, we opened it two weeks ago and we've had pretty much unanimous praise uh everyone loves it it looks it's insane good. online i know i couldn't couldn't make it down last week when uh rob and cohen found but it looks it looks incredible and i think it must have been such a different creative challenge because you mentioned as the festivals were progressing you were starting to have a lot more attention to detail to the production and installations you know, producing a lot an immersive light trail with with all of these um incredible installations was that something you quite enjoyed getting your teeth stuck into and not having to deal with artists and headliners and riders and just focusing on the creative yeah element? it was it was really interesting and refreshing because we're so used to that dynamic of uh assuring the sales good by assuring the lineups good assuring the lineups good by getting the right bands but um, unfortunately there's an ever decreasing circle of, of talent and an ever increasing talent bill and i think it's probably the biggest shame in the festival industry unfortunately is the amount of money that's being invested into the top 20 percent of the bill is it's, it's just not in the right place i'll be honest uh we doubled we've got topic a little bit here but we doubled the artist budget in the last five years for Kendall Corman. And I don't think the audience can substantially see it. Mm. And it's because the top end of the bill has just continued to be more and more expensive. Um, it's not helpful that Spotify don't pay artists. If Spotify paid artists and artists made money elsewhere, they wouldn't try and get all the money out of life. Um, but that, but that, that's an aside. Yeah, so to be in a position where we could just decide what the art looked like and we were curating the art ourselves there was no agents involved uh there's no scarcity because you know we just we want, we want to create a light piece we'll create a light piece uh the only scarcity was the fairy lights and uh okay. dbn or that'll be overseeing the creative and the install for us uh, done an incredible job uh stephen rang us up uh, we can't. I don't know if we kind of definitely decided to do it or if the contracts were signed, but he was like, "There's a there's a, there's a fairy light shortage. There's too, <laughs> many there's too many trails. There's too many trails." It was too plain sailing yeah. before that. There had yeah, to be yeah, a, yeah. a bit of drama. Brexit's caused problems. You know, all, all these supply chain issues. Uh, it's like I, I need to tell them by tomorrow if we want these fairy lights. I don't know if we can get them anywhere else. If not, we kind of you know you can't really have a Christmas trail without fairy lights. But he was. He was like, I want to do this whole avenue of trees to open it. 
So there's 36 trees to wrap in fairy lights. And um, the, the bill for the fairy lights was tens and tens and tens of thousands of pounds. Wow. So we're sitting there scratching our heads going, do we do this? Do we do this? Do we buy these lights? Should we buy these lights? Should we not buy these lights? Yeah. What's the worst case scenario? We left a lot of lights. It's like, well, they look cool in the trees at the festival if we don't, you know, if it all goes, all goes, goes wrong. So yeah, that was, that was a weird kind of early doors. And it's back to um, when people say, you know, when, when do you know you're doing an event? It's, it's kind of when you do something like that. It's like, right, well, we got the lights now. Yeah. And it's similar early days, Kendall Collins and sending Dizzy Rascals to be more money than I've ever seen in my life at that time. So only a couple of years in, I was like, okay, that's it. You know, we're definitely doing it. Yeah, I was at that year. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Really good. So what does what does the future hold? You've done you've done all these incredible things. What's your do you have a long term goal or are you just kind of taking things as they come? I I have an immediate goal and a consistent goal and it's been around for years now and that's just to find a nice balance of work and life and to be able to enjoy the moments that we're having uh, I don't think I'm too dissimilar to most most people it's been a weird 10 or 15 years in terms of the emergence of social media in terms of the uh, scale of uh, corporate investment in dragging our attention around you know in terms of trying to sell us things and everything else um, for me it's about just being able to step back and enjoy enjoy what I'm doing. Because I know if I look back on, on everything that I've done over the last 15 years, if at any point I'd have known I would get to here, I should have probably been less stressed and enjoyed it a little bit more. And and I we, think, we know events, I mean, we're all in the business, we know it's it's tough and it takes a certain type of person to, to put on events and run events, to keep doing it and scaling it up. When you look back, you've had some in, incredible highs. When you look back, were there any lows? Was there any times when things didn't go the way that you had planned? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think the highs and lows of Kendall in the early days were just every year, you know, because, it, because as much success as there would be, there would be so much responsibility and so many new things to learn in terms of how, how big the financial modelling got you know, we, we could be working on spreadsheets one day, one minute think we're in business and we're laughing and then go, no, you sure you got that formula right? I think, oh shit, are we bankrupt? Do you know that? That ride of just not knowing where it's going to land all the way to doing the festival and then after the festival wrapping it up. They, they were some pretty tough times because we, we were young guys, we didn't have any backing. It was literally me and Amzi sitting in his bedroom sometimes trying to buy Jamie on a couple of laptops that, you know, that was it. That was the whole piece you know we, we could have thousands of people expectations on our shoulders uh not really know where it's gonna gonna end up so there's been some hard times with that uh there's been some hard times on the shows that haven't worked you know we talked to all the shows that worked there we, we've done other festivals we've done forgotten fields down in kent we did that for one year didn't quite have the ticket sales for year two we invested in some guys up in scotland on a show called electric fields that was doing really well for a couple of years um, and then just didn't do the sales wasn't, wasn't really weren't really able to continue it and, and it's hard because people put their heart and souls into these things and when they don't go well and they turn into a real negative and they can be wrapped in a lot of debt it, you, you, it's a real burden take mm -hmm. something that you've loved something you put everything into you invite your friends your family and your world into and even if they've all enjoyed it you can kind of walk away from it and I've seen some people in, in bad places from that Probably the darker side of what I've seen. And how did you, how do you handle making those decisions? Is it like a group decision? Like, how do you kind of bring different people in at that right moment? Uh, in terms of whether or not to, to continue things. Um, yeah, group decisions really. It comes down to whoever the shareholders are. You know, there's, there's a lot of different roles on an event, but when you've got money in it yourself or you've got debt, it, it, it puts a different level of responsibility and a different vision on it for you. Um, yeah, it's a tough decision, and I, and I would say this to anyone who goes into promoting. One of the hardest things to do is just is just to stop and accept a bit of failure, and walk away having lost a little bit, rather than keep going and keep going and going. Uh, and we've had that conversation with some people we've worked with in the past, where we've actually stepped away from the event. They've decided to keep going with it because they've got so much of the heart involved in it, and they've just lost more money. Yeah. So it's a difficult thing. So yeah, there's some of the tougher times. And just as I say that, I think the whole piece 
I worry to talk is burnout. And this is for every role on events. There's, there's a huge level of nervous excitement wrapped into anxiety, wrapped into adrenaline that gets used when you do events. And when you do events, you've got to just be really, really careful to be kind to yourself to know when to just calm down, to know when to not just rely on loads of coffee and cigarettes to blast through till another 4 a.m. and then get up you know, the next day. It's kind of fun when you're first into it, maybe for a couple of years, it's part of the game. Uh, but you've got to know to step away from it. You've got to know that you know your time in your life is as important as your time in your work. And that's why I mentioned technology, I really didn't articulate it that well, but one of the biggest problems that we've all faced now is you know all the work WhatsApps that are on your phone. So there, there is no way of leaving the virtual office anymore. You're always there. And actually, it's not, it's not a healthy thing to always be in it. And that's, that's, a, you know, that's a, a hard thing to enforce, especially when you're, you know, you're going through that yourself, you're running events, but then you're also you know, a lead there. You've got a team to run and you know, having the, the confidence to apply those things, I think, is so important because it's so easy. You know, we're all, we all love it and because you know, we're passionate, we're all willing to... To work outside those hours but it takes like a strong leader to say listen no this is the culture i want to set this, these are the values of the company that i want from the start because i know it is going to be hard work but like burnt out people is not going to be any use not any use to anyone no no and so we had uh we had a team day last week last thursday got the whole team together for the first time really since since covid and that was what that day was about it's like look, we all know how to run the events we all know how to do our jobs we're not here today to talk about how to run a festival we don't have to do that Let's talk about how we need to exist as a team and how we communicate as a team. And it's something that I realised because I was reaching burnout and I and I found it hard having a certain level of responsibility to having a lot of staff, about 10 to 14 staff over the last few years. And me, I'm a people person. I've got quite a high level of emotional intelligence. So I care and engage on every per or try to with every person within that team. But when COVID happened and I just had to work out in the attic by myself, I loved it to start with. I was like, I just got to, I just need to do my own work. I can just focus on my own thing. I've not got a lot of other employees that I'm trying to help and all this stuff. That was great for a while, but I realized through this time that the most important thing or the thing that I want to invest my time in is creating, creating support and being part of a team because that's, that's the best thing in life. I realized that the, the best times I've enjoyed in life, even thinking back to school when I enjoyed going, it's when you're part of an identifiable gang of people you'd like spending time with. Like that's that's the best thing in life, you know. The reason for getting up in the morning yeah. and doing yeah, all, yeah. isn't it? So if you look back on everything you've achieved, look back on your career so far, would you go back and change anything if you had the chance? Probably not. No. I'm very lucky to <laughs> You've got to take the kind of wrong turns. Yeah, the, the right yeah. Turns there's well. a lot of a lot of highs and lows, but you know, I'm forty years old and have all the experiences that I've had for whether they're good or bad from the festivals and you know I'm lucky that going into next summer we've got two amazing shows that we're going to deliver I've got a really amazing team around me now uh, and I'm part of an amazing team you know and I think that's probably the important dynamic for me is to not feel like I'm in charge of it I just want to be part of it um, and no no I wouldn't change much other than just to enjoy it more you know Tip. Finally, for anyone who's tuned in, you know, we get a lot of different people who tune in, but often it's people who are, you know, maybe budding promoters or they run events themselves or they already have really successful events and they want to scale up. You know, being around as long as you've been and being across so many different types of events that you've you've run and successfully promoted, what have been your secrets to success? I don't think I can tell you those. <laughs> Well, what's um, got you through? What's no, uh... I'm sorry, I'm I was just stalling for time. <laughs> I, think. Uh, I guess strong, strong partnerships um, with other people. So I've worked with Andy since we started Kendall Calling, and that's 18 years now. We, we've been in business together. J Jamie and his brother's been around from probably year two. As I said, Roxy's been in the mix on our show since show since about year five. Those really strong relationships. Uh, are, are my success they're not the secret of it or part of it I've never done anything by myself I, I really wouldn't be able to do anything that is on my CV by myself 
and I would I would challenge people to find good people that you work well with and share the burden um, because there are sleepless nights there are huge balls of crushing anxiety that you go through huge levels of imposter syndrome that will hit you you know it's it's fucking hard it's not easy to as a human invite thousands of other humans to come and look at the thing you've done <laughs> you know it's like stressful so the more you can build a good team or good partnerships and work with nice people um the better really and, and don't and don't think you're winning by screwing other people over because it, it, it's not that's not what it's about well listen i'm gonna have to uh wrap things up because i could listen to you all day it's been it's oh, been good. so inspiring well, since everything uh, but thank you so much for coming in thanks for sharing the, the highs the lows and, and everything in between and we'll hopefully try and get you back on for another episode in the near future but yeah thank you so much for coming on no worries Thank you.